California is a beautiful place to live. I get it. The politics are odd, maybe even terrible, but oh well. It's a beautiful place to live. And many have left, but again, we have so many incredible things in California. We have the mountains. We have the ocean landscapes. We even have the desert. Even our desert is pretty. We have Disneyland. Come on, anybody else out there? Maybe one day it'll be open again. I think it just happened. See, we have these incredible things at our disposal, but really what sets California apart, God bless the tech industry. I know we've changed the world that way. But what sets California apart is our agriculture. We have a beautiful harvest inside of California. Now, I was calling my friends the other day. We were about to plant our garden, and they were asking what we were planting. I go through all these varietals, and they say, you are so lucky. Because we can plant anything here, and it grows. I mean, there are so many varietals. We have lush gardens in our backyards that many would die to have because the conditions are ripe for harvest. See, our agricultural industry is, is incredibly profitable when it's not drought season. But that being said, it's $21 billion a year just in the produce revenue here in California. However, there's one small farm, tiny farm, 30 miles long, five miles wide. that is the most profitable farm in the world. It's a small little place called Napa Valley. And Napa Valley... Just that small little area alone, do we have the pictures here, has $34 billion of economic impact a year. Over 190,000 jobs nationwide come from this small little place. Napa, incredible. Now, Napa is known for these lustrous grapes, and they beat out the French in many things. But as we have this place in 2014, there was declared a national state of emergency in California by Governor Brown because we were in severe drought. Severe drought. So there's three types of drought that takes place. Do we have that three types of drought? We have three types. We have meteorological, which is surface drought, agricultural soil drought, and then root drought is where it's at. We were right there at the soil level of drought. Here's that picture of Folsom Lake in 2011 when it was full in 2014, right when they declared the national emergency. This is Folsom Lake. So actually, we walked out to the middle of that main portion. There was an old Mormon city that was at the middle of Folsom Lake. And they were finding artifacts and all these kinds of things in the early 1900s. This was the state in 2014. Now, agriculture has a huge effect with the drought that took place. We knew we would lose crops. But what makes Napa different than the normal agricultural industry is these vines are old. They're 50 to 75 years old. Now you can plant new and fresh crops, but you can't plant new vines overnight. So 2014, they had a good harvest. It was lean, drier years are better for grapes. 2015, severe drought. We hit the soil level of drought. Finally, 2016 happens. There is no water in Napa Valley. Zero. And all the vineyard owners think they're done. Because at this point, if the vine undergoes too much stress, no fruit's produced. Write that down. If the vine produces too much stress, no fruit will be produced. Some of you need to stop stressing out and being so anxious in your life. It's cutting off the life of the fruit of God inside of you. There we go. Side note. Too much stress, no fruit. No water. They literally put their vines through what they call stress tests so that the vineyard owners know how much water to give them because the greater the stress, the greater the fruit. But in this regard, there was no water. And to the surprise of all the vineyard owners, 2016 was one of the greatest harvests in Napa's history. One of the greatest harvests took place. Because what we find out is this, in the driest season, the roots have to go deeper to find water. In the driest season, the roots have to go deeper to find water for the fruit of the harvest. Michael Honig, a famous winemaker, Honig Winery, said this. In normal conditions, the roots of the grapevine grows 10 feet deep. But in dry conditions, they are forced to burrow twice as deep in search for water. The stressed out vines produce a smaller grape, but one with more concentrated power. Come on, church. The deeper the roots, the greater the power. The deeper the stress, the deeper the disaster, the greater the power that happens and takes place. I talked to one wine specialist. He said, you know what was so unique about 2016? He said, all of the vineyards thought they were going to die. These are the actual grapevines. 
But when they're at the place where they're at their last harvest, they produce the greatest fruit because they think it's their last harvest. The vine literally thinks, this is it. Give it your best. This is all we have left. Give it everything you have. And the greatest harvest. Now, at the end of 2016, I remember that day, first week of October, my friend Mike Breen was traveling here, and the rain fell, and we knew the drought was over. And the drought ended, but the drought continued in the church. The drought in the natural was over. The drought in the spiritual was not. And those seasons were dry. And we saw this last year when we thought it couldn't get any drier. 2020 happens. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine. My father is the vine grower. He removes every branch that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. How many underwent some pruning last year? God was just cutting things off left and right. But within this, I saw tremendous stress on many. And as I saw the seasons of the church these last seven years, we thought it couldn't get any harder. And 2020 hits. And last year, I saw more people leave the faith than I ever have in my life. They said, this is too much. It's too dry. It's too hard. Some denying Jesus, some just leaving everything. How many know somebody that walked away last year? They were impacted by this. They made decisions that would destroy their families. But at the same time, as I look in the eyes of the leaders in this room, the congregation members here, I saw many choose to dig deeper. You chose to push past the pain. You chose to not give up. You said, God, you got to be out there somewhere. And if you're not, I'm going to produce one last harvest. I'm going to produce one last bit. And the fruit might be small, but the Lord says it's powerful. And when I look in the eyes of our leaders, when I look in the eyes of our young ones, I see their heart is there. And there's a power that God is releasing within us. But are we prepared for the pressing? Are we prepared for the pressing? Because guess what? That little bowl of fruit that you have, that you're so proud of because you survived last year, it's not just meant for you. See, what Jesus does is he harvests all these disciples and he prunes them. He shows them signs and wonders and miracles. And as they're there hanging around his table, they're hanging out at his house. He surprises them all in Luke 10. And he calls 70 of them. See, there was more than 12. There was 12 apostles, 12 leaders. But he had this whole crew of 70 disciples. This small tribe. And he says, I'm going to give you authority. To cast out demons and heal the sick. They think to ourselves, we're not ready for this. He says, I know. I know. But the harvest is plentiful. And the laborers are few. Therefore, pray that the Lord of the harvest might send laborers into the harvest. See, Jesus stands as the Lord of the harvest. And he's sending out his labor. He's sending them out because he knows that the field is ripe and ready. Church, let me tell you, our nation may be crazy. Our politics might be upside down, but the field is ready for harvest. See, the amount of loneliness and isolation that took place last year, people are longing and hungry for community like they've never been before. Spoken on this many times. I've given stats I've given statistics, but here's the problem. None of them are relevant anymore because everyone's lonely. It used to be a surprise to us about chronic loneliness. Now it's evident everywhere. You ever be with somebody and they just start spilling their whole life out in front of you? And this is what you say. I know it because I'm guilty too. I don't have time for this. Don't they know I'm busy? And the Lord says... Shut your mouth and listen. <laughs> when someone starts spilling, when the moment you start thinking, man, they talk too much, that means they have no one to talk to. If it happens seven or eight times, maybe there's no self-awareness. But in that moment, <laughs> that means you get to sit as Jesus in the flesh and welcome their heart. 
and learn to listen. He sends laborers in the harvest. This is a harvest time, church. Two weeks ago, I have this dream and I'm approaching this giant house. I mean, this house is huge. But as I approach it, I know, this is what's odd. I know it's filled with believers, but mostly of the Slavic community. And so as I walk into this house, the door is huge and it's wide open. As I walk through the door, I see all these people from the rock, all these leaders. But what catches my attention the most is that, you know, the center kitchen island everybody has? Well, this center island wasn't just in the kitchen. It extended multiple room lengths. I'm talking massive living room lengths. And the feast on this center island was massive, a feast like I had never seen before. But what caught me by surprise is the front half was reserved for fruit. And it's filled with this fruit. I'm not talking about Costco trays that you buy that are cut up with a really sour pineapple and cantaloupe. You know what I'm talking about? Not that, not that kind of fruit display. It literally looks like someone took baskets of fruit and dumped it on this countertop and it's overflowing. And literally I hear the phrase, there was a harvest in this house. There was a harvest in this house. And the moment I say that, I look over to my left, I hear someone enter, and it's a guy from the gym that I, in real life, have been praying for. And I see him there, and I, the first thought is, he's not a believer. He doesn't belong here. <laughs> and as he walks in, he's welcomed by someone else that also isn't a believer. And I think to myself, what is, what, what's going on here? He's not saved. And I hear the Holy Spirit say, he feels welcome here. And he feels like he belongs here. I wake up from the dream. I'm like, okay, if that's not God, I don't know what is. And as I'm there, I just hear the Holy Spirit say, there's a harvest at hand. It's time to get the house ready. There's a harvest at hand. It's time to get the house ready. I feel like God's going to do something significant. And honestly, I think the Slavic community is going to be a huge part of this revival. Just, again, not to make you feel awkward, but if you are part of the Slavic community, either born and raised or married into, just lift your hand up real quick. I want to pray for you. Okay, a few, a few people here, a few people here. Can I make you feel really awkward? Can you just stand real quick? Just stand up. See, you like that little pastor setup? That's the pastor trick, by the way. <laughs> lift a hand to stand. Extend your hands, church. Holy Spirit, we just declare in Jesus' name, there will be a breakout and a breakthrough in the Slavic community that we will see signs and wonders and miracles. The lost will be saved. They have modeled community. They live community. They know what it looks like to share with one another. They've lived Acts 2. And we say, help them lead the way. Help them show us the way. There will be no denominational barriers. There will be no breakdown in language. We say, Jesus, have your way. Signs and wonders and miracles. Do it in our midst. In Jesus' Jesus name. Amen. Amen. See, the Lord says we have to prepare the house, but here's what's unique. When he sends laborers in the harvest, he shows a new way because he knew the old way wouldn't work. He warned them in Luke five, verse 37. No one puts new wine in the old wineskins or else the new wine will burst the wineskins. We spilled and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. So what's the new wineskin? See, Jesus takes these disciples, he sends them out, but here's the new method and model that he shows them. As soon as they go out into the harvest, he calls them back to the house. Because every harvest needs a house to hold it. Every harvest needs a home. No one goes out into the field with bushels of wheat or produce. They have to have a storehouse to hold it within. There's a little secret here in Luke 10. Everybody skips over it. But in Luke 10, as he celebrates the harvest, as they see Satan fall like lightning, the strongholds are broken, he immediately takes them into a new house. Luke 10, 38. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Why is this significant? They become the pillars of the new church, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Many believe that this is one of the heartbeat centers of the New Testament church. As soon as the harvest happens, he's right in the house of these new disciples. And he teaches them away. Now you're like, well, that's a bit of a stretch. 
That's not what the author's intent is, Brandon. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. He said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And he sat at a dinner table in his house. And many tax collectors and sinners were sitting with him and his disciples. People often interpret this verse wrongly, honestly. They think Jesus calls Matthew and then goes to Matthew's house. Not how it works. Jesus calls Matthew, invites him to his house, which was Peter's house. And the tax collectors and sinners were welcome. You see, the normal system that was set up in that time frame was you would call someone to repentance and invite them to the synagogue. But Jesus knows the synagogue wants no part of sinners. The harvest at hand, we have to change our methodology. It's not to get them saved to go to church. It's to get them saved to be a part of the church, you, Ecclesia. That's the whole goal here. And we're going to see people get saved and be a part of our community that will never meet and will never be in these four walls. That's a win, church. That's the hope. I can't wait for someone to introduce me and say, hey, this is so-and-so. And I get to say, hi there, I'm Brandon. And they have no idea who I am. That's the win. Nameless, faceless community seeking the heart of Jesus. Seeking after, yes, Chip and Michelle did that. No, you guys will hear about that in a minute. It's not about celebrity. It's not about pulpit. It's not about positions of higher authority. Jesus is the authority. Jesus is the chief shepherd. And he's the one that's going to lead these houses. Last year, when everything was shut down, we were working on this house church, you know, network. We were developing. COVID hits. Everything gets shut down. Those three house churches started on their own. Guess whose schedule they followed? Jesus's, not ours. He's up to something big, church. But it's about us being connected, part of community, part of what God is doing in our city. I believe we're called to be forerunners and first fruits of this, to show and model a new way. See, what Peter does is he follows the same system that Jesus modeled to him. In Acts 2.41, we see this giant harvest. That day, 3,000 were baptized at the speaking and teaching of Peter. Guys, we're not talking commitment cards. 3,000 baptisms of households. That's how they counted. They didn't count individuals. They counted houses. This is an unprecedented move of the Holy Spirit. And what they saw in part with Jesus now explodes on the scene. And immediately after the harvest, where do we find them? In the house. Verse 46. Day by day, they spent much time together in the temple, broke bread, where? At the home. They gathered in their houses and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. How many are glad for good food in Jesus' name? Stop serving bad pre-made food from Costco. God bless it. If that's all you know, that's fine. Find someone that can cook. Eat good food at your house. Please, please. I guarantee that last supper was unprecedented. Amazing. Good food. Now, we have people say all the time, what is Acts 2 community? Isn't that just community group? And you just changed a fancy name? Don't go and invite your friends to Acts 2 community. Don't. They're, they don't know what that means. They have no clue. You want to come to my Acts 2 community? Quote, unquote, what the hell is that? That's what they're going to say. I know I offended you. It's just religious spirit leaving. It's fine. <laughs> Honestly, if we invite them into Acts 2 communities, they're not going to know what that is. Invite them to your house. Invite them to you. You want to come over for dinner? I'm having some friends over this Tuesday or Thursday or Friday night. It's a different context. Now, I'm going to pull back the veil in church world. We change all these names, all these phrases. Community groups are amazing. God has done great things in them. But the era for the last 50 years, the, the core word is small group. And what we've done for the last 50 years is just change the phrase small group. The 70s, they really became popular as part of the modern church growth era movement. 
So we realized in order for churches to grow, you had to have these small groups. And we changed them to small groups, to cell groups, to life groups, to house groups, to D groups. We've just changed the same name. It's a small group. It's what it is. And we call them community groups because we know community is at the center of it. But the small group system was this, four-pronged system. All small groups had a study that follows a syllabus, that follows a schedule, that follows a script. It's great. And it's been good. And this is where I'm probably going to offend you. These were fine. I'm not insulting. People became believers and grew as disciples because of this system. It's a good system. It's effective. There is one key ingredient that's missing in this formula. The Holy Spirit. And food. He's a part of that. Don't worry. Food's there. I'm not saying the Holy Spirit wasn't in the study. I'm not saying he wasn't part of the syllabus or the schedule or the questions of the script. But are we making room for him to move? The core belief of an Acts 2 community is Acts 2 community is spirit-led. That's what's at the heartbeat of Acts 2. The spirit needs to lead because we're really good in capital C church of quoting Acts 2.42, but we leave out 43. Why? Because it messes everything up. And awe came upon every heart. And signs and wonders and miracles were being done by the apostles. Guys, if you don't have room for the Holy Spirit, no miracles. Because guess what? When the Holy Spirit's involved, he'll change the study. He'll ignore the syllabus. (laughs) He'll mess up the schedule. And he'll rip the script. That's what he does. He's really good at it. I just get this picture of the Holy Spirit like one of those erratic directors in Hollywood. Like, do it again. Do this. And ripping the script and starting over. He loves it. He wants to keep you on your toes. And guess what? That's the safest place to be. The Spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. And we have to crucify that flesh. It's time for us to be a part of this new movement of Acts 2 where the Spirit leads. And we're going to go through two other elements these next two weeks. But here's one important thing. If we're going to see the lost get saved, go put that that small group system up. They're not going to fit in this box. They won't. They're going to ask you so many annoying questions. You're going to be like, we can't get through the syllabus exactly. But they need a place to belong. They won't fit in your box, but they'll sit at your table. Put that picture up of Jesus. They'll sit at your table. This is what he did. They never fit in the religious system. They never fit in the synagogue box. But they sat at this table. And here's the warning today, church, before Chip and Michelle, their testimony. Nick, make sure to let children's ministry know we're running late. Jesus gives the warning that new wine needs a new wineskin. But we often miss this one verse that's only in Luke. Luke 5, verse 39. And no one having drunk old wine immediately desires the new. For he says, the old is better. If we're going to see the harvest in the house, that spirit needs to die. It's not a disrespect to the old. It's not a dishonor. It served its season. A new one is at hand. We have to make room for the new. Here's where we get confused. It's still a wineskin. It's just a new one. It's the same material in essence. But the old one has served its time. A new one is here. And that new one needs to be multi-generational, multi-ethnic, And that needs to have room for the lost to be welcomed.